Oh, amen, and welcome to worship. To we come to uh, glorify a King who is indeed great in power, great in glory, great in wonder. And uh, so many of the Psalms talk about that, don't they? Uh, and it speaks about how even if we didn't uh, sing out, even if we didn't offer uh, glory, the nature itself would do that. And we can see that in the, in the, in the wonder of, of those, uh, the powerful things that we might see, that even in the, uh, the, the storm, it seems to speak out about the wonder and, and the awe of, the, of our mighty God. Uh, we can see it in the, the, the delicacy of, of flowers and leaves and things. The, the, we have such a, a God that is, is so interested in the little things and the little things of our lives. Even, even if we didn't cry out, nature itself indeed would cry out. That is the God that we come to worship today. Let us indeed come in worship, bring our praise, bring our prayers and lift up this glorious God. Let us come and worship. And we're going to sing again a song that allows us to sing along with creation, to speak out that uh, creation indeed uh, lifts up and honours the wonderful creator God. Let's stand and sing, shall we? Let all creation dance in energy supply as orders and stations on holy space and time for nature's heart in glory grows in newly shows God's see uh, as each week comes along more and more familiar faces coming back and this uh, church building uh, filling up again uh, and we actually had a bit of stress as we were coming in today and a good sort of stress we're going to have too many people we're going to how, how are we going to fit everybody in are we going to need to set up an overflow or whatever so we're getting to that point and we're working to that point so that we can actually say no need to register just turn up uh, and we will set up something perhaps in the hall or outside so that you don't need to think, oh, I better I stay home today because I might take somebody else's seat. We want people to come. 
So it is a, a real wonder, uh, and a special greeting also to those people at home. Um, for those that are here, people on the, t on the uh, TVs at home might not have seen, but you might have recognised that we had somebody different singing up the front this morning, and I thought I'd just better uh, uh, introduce and say thank you to our son Jesse, for, uh, who's up visiting us at the moment, and uh, stepping in to help with our uh, singing this morning at the last moment. Uh, so thanks, Jesse, for, for, for that. Um, um, and we will be including in our prayers in a little while um, uh, uh, the uh, Ian and, and uh, Heather Dearness. Uh, the reason Julie is not here to help lead singing is that um, uh, Ian has had some sort of a turn this morning and is up in hospital. So we remember him and, and Heather in our prayers and pray for Julie as well as uh, she is with their family. But let us um, come in worship and let us come in prayer, shall we? Let us pray. Lord, when we gaze at our southern skies, we see your infinite and boundless creation and we can only say with your psalmist David that the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. So we come in worship, in awe, that you are also entwined with our lives and you are with us no matter where our lives take us. Be with us in our worship today, wherever we may be. Lord, help us to hear your word, to recognise your presence and your nearness with us, as we are united today with brothers and sisters around the world, in worship, in praise, and at the table of Jesus Christ. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasant, pleasing in your sight, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. And Lord, your Apostle Paul reminds us that we no longer need to perform exemplary deeds in order to earn your love. When we believe perfect deeds is all that are required to be righteous and secure in lo your love, then we have missed the mark. So Lord, we come in confession this morning of those times then uh, we put ourselves above you. So Lord, when we rebel, forgive us, Lord. Remind us that, uh, that all that we have uh, that's righteous comes from God through faith in Christ. Father, when we are slow to accept your gracious and unconditional love and fail to share that love with others, Lord, forgive us. When we crave ownership of the earth and all that is in it and fail to understand that we are only stewards, forgive us, Lord. When we fail to acknowledge your lordship on our lives and place ourselves in your service, forgive us, Lord. So, Lord, hear these prayers and the quiet prayers on each of our hearts, hearts as we uh, recognise the way that we put ourselves ahead of you. Lord, accept these prayers, our deepest prayers of regret, of sorrow, of grief, of repentance, <coughs> as we come to you today and lay them all down at your feet. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, who takes them and throws them away as far as from the east and from the west. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in Christ our Saviour and our Rock, our righteousness is one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that is based on faith. The good news then is this, in Jesus we are accepted, loved and forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hopefully uh, people have received a copy of the um, 
of this week's um, outreach. Uh, and uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, read that, take the time um, just to see what is happening around the place. I won't go through it all because um, we've got a busy morning this, this morning, but there's uh, church council in the report that's in there. Have a look through and see what the church council, uh, some of the issues and things that uh, the council and the elders are working through. There's an update on uh, funds that have been received for um, support of the um, Uniting Care community uh, uh, room for children. Just on that, um, I don't know whether anybody uh, reads the, the Townsville Bulletin. There was actually a report in the Townsville Bulletin uh, this, this week about uh, the fact that uh, children's services in, Australia, in, in Townsville are being overrun and there's a waiting list. Um, uh, uh, Act for Kids, I think, is uh, one of the main groups that are going through that, and, and same with Uniting Care. Such is the issue, uh, issues around family life and drug, drug addiction and everything, that there's actually a waiting list for, for children to get in and receive the care that they need. So thank you for the support that you've, uh, you've given towards that program. The other thing uh, that uh, I wanted just to touch on this morning um, is uh, an update on the uh, the stable, which is no longer the stable on the, the strand, but the stable on the streets. And so we're going to watch uh, a little video clip now just to uh, give you an idea of what that is all about this year. So stable on the streets, a whole new concept. Uh, and I'm learning more and more about that. Uh, opportunity for us as a church, uh, instead of the stable all happening at one place down on the strand, churches are encouraged to put up displays to actually take uh, the story of Christmas out into the streets of Townsville. So we'll be looking at somehow over those five days of having some sort of a display, something here, Christmas lights across the front of the church, maybe having even some uh, 
uh, groups of people out singing carols out on the footpath uh, for, for cars as they stop at the traffic lights, things like that. So we're looking at ideas, but it's even more than that. It's encouraging people to do something in their own homes. Similar to what happened um, at Anzac Day this year where there was no um, uh, marches and people were encouraged to actually go out onto the footpath um, of their streets and in, in their neighbourhoods. For, uh, for us to do that as, as Christians and as the church across Townsville. Can you do something at your own home? Put up Christmas lights, put something out on the footpath, something uh, you can get the uh, stable on the streets star that you can display out um, on your fence or out the front. Uh, and so we can actually take the story of Christmas even wider than the Strand does out into the streets. So there'll be more coming on that. And if you've got any ideas on how we can do that or you would like to do something and need more information, Come and see me as we take the story um, of uh, Christmas, of the birth of our Lord Jesus uh, into the community. As we uh, uh, prepare to um, hear our, uh, the, the, our scripture readings for today and see where our message is taking us, uh, we're going to sing again. Let's uh, sing um, the song Praise and Thanksgiving. Oh, sorry, we're going to have, we've got the, the readings up there already. We'll have our readings first by the looks of things. <laughs> oh, I'm out of sync. Technology t rules us these days, doesn't it? The first Bible reading this morning is from the New Testament. Philippians 3, verses 4b to 14. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Je Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and, he and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press, forward, press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 46. The parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to, to collect the fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. 
But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on, his, on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, what a challenging uh, passage. Um, And we'll um, have a look at that in a moment. But let's uh, stand and sing now. Praise and thanksgiving, another wonderful song of praise and glory of our amazing God. For many of you, 
you might be having this sense of deja vu. Didn't we have something, a, a story about the, the vineyards and workers only a couple of weeks ago? Uh, and it, that's the way it is at the moment as we uh, wend our way through the lectionary. Uh, we're going through the parables of Jesus and uh, the fact that there are so many parables that uh, reflect on, on vineyards and, and wine growing, it gives us an indication of that perhaps it was a huge part of uh, the economy and, and life uh, in uh, Palestine uh, back in those days in that, that part of the world. But we are back in the vineyard again with uh, the parable that is known as the parable of the tenants. Now, as, as you probably have listening to this story, I'm sure most of us, uh, if, if pressed, could come up with a story about experiences that we've had with bad tenants or stories that we've heard about bad tenants. Let me give you a couple that immediately come to mind for, for myself. Um, many of you, I'm sure, still remember um, uh, my Uncle Alan and Artie Merle that were here before, um, uh, before I came up here. and. Um, uh, Alan and Merle at, uh, years ago had this beautiful um, big house uh, at Norman Park overlooking the Brisbane River um, and it was uh, a very special architecturally designed home that actually won a number of awards um, and they for a period of time needed to go overseas so they rented this beautiful um, house out um, and all of a sudden they're overseas and they get a call from the real estate agents to go up there and find that it's been absolutely trashed, that the people who rented it out had uh, <laughs> falsified their documents and it was actually uh, a whole group of unemployed people that had been pooling their, uh, their, their money together so that they could actually live in this, this great big mansion uh, by themselves and it was absolutely trashed and you can, you can imagine uh, the heartache. Uh, in, in the work involved in trying to uh, make that home, that house, back into a home again. Another story that comes to mind uh, is uh, back in my uh, ministry at, at Harvey Bay, we had a, a, a conference uh, centre there next to the church uh, that we rented out to uh, an agency um, and we had vetted them and all was all really, really good. Um, but they had decided in order to try and cover their costs, they would sublet it out so that they would actually um, you know, get some uh, income from subletting it to other groups. And I woke up one day and opened up the uh, local newspaper to find an ad for the Harvey Bay Spiritualist Church holding seances at the <laughs> in our building. So you can imagine, um, <laughs> it didn't take long for me to be getting on the phone and saying, oh, this is, this is, just, this is just not on. <laughs> um, we could probably come up with uh, many images of, of what happens um, when people uh, forget who, is, who actually owns, who's actually in charge, and when, when they start to take on ownership of themselves and that they, that they can just treat it uh, the way they want to. And this story uh, that Jesus is saying is that this is what has happened with the people of Israel. Uh, it's, uh, it is a story that is pointing out that God had created this, this vineyard, this, this place that, that was indeed uh, the house of Israel, the Jewish nation. And the, the leaders of, of this, the tenants who were the, the, the priests and those that should have been ensuring that it was bearing much fruit, had lost their way and they were beginning to see it um, as something of their own. Um, for a lot of the people who read uh, or were listening to Jesus at that time, there's probably another passage that, uh, from the Hebrew scriptures that would have come to mind because it's very similar. Uh, and it's a story that was told some hundreds of years earlier by the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah um, had this prophecy, uh, or, and it's called the Song of the Vineyard. He said, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You can see the similarities 
between these two passages, uh, hundreds of years apart, but still talking about this vineyard and how uh, it's fallen into disarray. The prophet calls Israel's, uh, Israel God's vineyard. And he warns it as he, within this, if you look at the whole text, that he would lay waste to it because it produced only worthless grapes. And now uh, Jesus is using that same description to show that God expects fruit from his vineyard. After all, why would you go to the bother of planting a vineyard, to going to, to all that work, building uh, fences, putting up uh, watchtowers, if you didn't expect fruit? God had done everything possible to provide for Israel, his vineyard. And like the landowner in Jesus' parable, uh, who also put a, a, this vineyard, uh, he was expecting fruit. He was expecting good things. He entrusted his people to be the leaders who, if they'd been faithful, would have harvested a bumper crop. Israel should have been a light to the nations, pointing people to God who has so richly supplied their needs. God who provided so abundantly for his vineyards had every right to expect the fruit and fruit and harvest from which he would profit. But Jesus is pointing out that the Jewish leaders and the authorities wrongly had come to believe that they owned the vineyard, that they were in charge, that they thought it was solely their ministry and they were using it for their own selfish purposes. And Israel time and time again rejected the prophets that God sent to rectify this. And finally, God sent his son, saying, surely my son can make the difference. But here is where the parable and the actual story um, begin to uh, differ. Jesus had come. The son had come, but he was rejected. And Jesus in this parable was ultimately saying that it would not be the Jewish nation that would continue to manage God's earthly kingdom, but God was about to hand it over to new tenants, the Gentile nations who would soon rise up to be the Christian church. Something new would rise out of the ashes of what was about to happen. So what about us? Is this just a nice, although challenging, lesson about church history? Is this okay? We can sit back and say, well, this is just a story that Jesus told as a way to get back to the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Does this actually speak into our modern context? I believe we too are greatly privileged in what God has given us. And we are that new vineyard that, God was point, that Jesus was pointing to. We are the new vineyard that was taken away from the bad tenants. But are we any better than the past ones? Are we the new tenants, the modern church? You and I, are we any better? Do we, are we really accepting the Lordship of Christ? Do, are we really giving all due to God? He has given us his word. He supplied us with everything pertaining to life and goodness. And the Christian church should be bearing fruit. We should be growing. We should be changing the world. We should be out in the community. We should be being the people and the vines and, and what God has created us to. And he's given us everything that we need to make that happen, to grow up individually, as strong Christians, but also as a church to grow up, to bear fruit and to make a difference. So as a church, there are probably some questions we should be asking ourselves as we look at this passage. We should be asking, what are we cultivating as a church? And is it growing well? What is wild and untamed within the life of our church that needs to be weeded out? What is it that we are doing that gives God glory? What are we growing on the other side that is not of God and does not point to Jesus? Are we being good tenants of the vineyard? 
Because the problem is, it's easy to start enjoying the grapes. There's nothing better than fresh produce, isn't it? Anybody who's grown their own, uh, their own garden, whether it be uh, uh, grapes or vegetables or whatever, there's nothing better than going out and, and to pull something freshly grown on your garden out and enjoy it. And uh, it's very easy as a church for us to, to perhaps start to believe that we are the ones that should be profiting from the hard work that we do. And we begin to make decisions and run programs that suit us but deny the desires and the wishes of God. We either bear no fruit or as in desire, not so much fruit as weeds. But we need to remember that the church is not our church. It is not the church council's church. It is not the elders' church. It is not my church. It is not your church. It is the Lord's church. He is the owner of the vineyard and he allows us to work we have the privilege of working in his vineyard. We are truly blessed. We need to perhaps reflect on the basis of union in the words that said, the church as the fellowship of the Holy Spirit confesses Jesus as Lord over its own life. It also confesses that Jesus is head over all things, the beginning of a new creation of a new humanity. Do we give all glory to God? Are we trying our best to bear fruit for the true owner of the vineyard? Perhaps this is an important point as we commence uh, the discernment for uh, new leaders of the church. Can you believe that we're at that point of, of the year where we're about to put out nominations for church council and elders for 2021? But that's where we are. And as we look at where we're going in the new year and what leaders we need to have, we need to ensure that we've got uh, our eye on the ball because God expects fruit from his people the other thing that I get from the passage here is that like the landowner that keeps sending servants to remind the tenants God is constantly raising up people within the church is constantly sending us uh, ministers, evangelists he gives us uh, the, uh, his holy word to dwell on he gives us his Holy Spirit to inspire and to correct our thoughts. But do we really take notice? Or do we also, in many ways, reject Jesus? How often have you been driving along uh, a road coming and then suddenly you see a car coming from the other direction flash its lights? Automatically, uh, even without thinking, you probably take your foot off the accelerator pedal. Look, there's a speed camera up ahead or there's a police car. And you may not be speeding, but all of a sudden that flash of lights hits something and all of a sudden it is a reminder to you that you perhaps have taken your mind off the road. You haven't been watching your speed. That is what God does when he sends us his spirit and messages. Flashes, uh, perhaps, just to ensure that uh, we've got our, um, our focus correctly. But we, do we take notice? These gentle reminders, even though are coming constant, will never be enough to keep us on track. And that is why today, especially, as we gather around the Lord's table, we remember that out of the great love and mercy of God, God sent his son Jesus. The ultimate reminder to us of who is in charge. God sent his son but like the landowner's son in the parable, Jesus was rejected and killed. But God raised him up to be the chief cornerstone to install him in the chief place of honour he deserves. And there are times when we seek our own ways rather than pay God what is due. And every time we do this, we in a sense are rejecting the son who was sent for us. The son who was sent to remind us who was in charge. Every time we sin, every time we fail to give God his due, we are like those tenants in the vineyard who rejected the Son. It is our sins that place Jesus on that cross. It is our sins, our way, way, wayfulness, that causes Jesus again and again, in a sense, to have to pay the due for our sins.
But here's where the story changes. Because even though we fail to give God his due, we fail uh, in our ability, perhaps, to honour God in everything that we do, we are not cast out of the vineyard. That was the purpose for Jesus' coming. And even though uh, we fail again and again and again, it is actually through the sacrifice of Jesus who gave himself up out of his infinite grace and mercy that we are given another chance. We are not cast out, but we are welcomed back in if we turn our eyes and recognise who Jesus is. I'm reminded of a famous hymn by Charles Wesley who said, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Our God is a God of infinite grace and mercy and second chances. But that doesn't mean we need to rely on them. There is a day of reckoning coming when the sun will return again. Will we be ready? Will we acknowledge his reign and his rule? Will we be prepared to be, uh, for his return so that we are not cast out but entered in to the eternal kingdom of God? Who is in charge of your vineyard? Who is in charge of this vineyard? When you declare in your singing and your prayers, Jesus is Lord, do you really mean it? Maybe a um, way of finishing up is just to re uh, relate to you the words of a, a song um, that I, we don't sing so much anymore called When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Let us labour for the Master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us indeed labour for the Master. Let us indeed recognise who is in charge of the vineyard. And then when our labour and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder, will be there. Amen. Just in a, as we prepare to sing our, our next song, which is Worthy of My Days, uh, just take a moment to reflect on that. Who is the owner of your vineyard? Do you indeed give all honour that is due to God? Recognise the ways perhaps before we come to the Lord's table in the ways that you have failed and you perhaps have rejected the sending of the Son who has come to you to remind you actually who you are, who to, to whom you belong, to who uh, you, you, you need to give honour and praise and glory. Just dwell on that as we prepare to sing this next song.
and whether you picked up on the words in that song, that last verse where we said, it's my heart's desire to sup with my Lord. As we come now and meet at the Lord's table, I pray that it is indeed your heart's desire that perhaps something in what has been said this morning has touched you. Maybe you've recognised that you haven't given God the glory and that you have been rejected, rejecting Jesus. And indeed, it's because of those things that Jesus actually had to do what he did. And that is indeed your sins that were nailed to the cross. So as we come to the table and Jesus bids us to come and remember, don't only just remember the... Uh, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, but also remember why he did it. Dwell on that and allow your heart to be filled with the joy that comes from knowing forgiveness through Jesus as we come and share at the table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Be present, risen Lord Jesus, as you were with your disciples, and make yourself known to us in the breaking of bread. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We hear the words of the institution of the sacrament, as recorded by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you indeed proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Lord, according to our Saviour's command, we set aside the bread and the cup, both here and those that we've got in our homes, uh, that we've set aside from common purpose for the Holy Supper to which we are called. And so, Lord, we come to you with our prayers of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God, for you have made us uh, known, you have made yourself known to us through Jesus Christ and given us a new righteousness based on faith. You created the entire universe, the sky declares your glory, day and night show the brilliance of your ways. You brought your people out of slavery and gave them your laws and commandments that you might be rich in spirit and clear in vision. And though we repeatedly rejected your ways and destroyed your messages, you sent your son to us to renew heaven's call. Though the crowds recognised him as a prophet, those who desired his inheritance seized and killed him. But you raised him from the dead. And now through the power of his resurrection, he stands as the cornerstone of righteousness, the first fruits of the kingdom and the incomparable prize to which we press. And so we praise you with the faithful of every time and place, joining with choirs of angels and the whole creation in the eternal hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So Lord, in accordance with your command, we have prepared for this special act of remembrance. Send down your Holy Spirit that the gifts of bread and wine may be for us, the body and the blood of Christ. Unite us with him forever and bring us with the whole creation to your eternal kingdom. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, to the unity in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we worship you in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power 
be yours forever and ever. Amen. So the bread we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. The cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. These are indeed the gifts of God for the people of God. Receive this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. We serve an open table for all of those all of you who truly repent, who recognise Jesus as Lord, who seek to remember uh, and through this act to, uh, to respond to God's grace and mercy, the invitation to, to you is come to the Lord's table. As we do so, um, uh, in order to meet the various requirements about social distancing, uh, we will proceed uh, one pew at a time, starting on this side, going front to back, uh, and then... Um, perhaps front to back on this side. I just ask so that we don't end up with a long line uh, up, the, up the middle. Just wait until the pew in front of you has gone so that we can maintain that one and a half uh, metres distance. I'm sorry we need to do all of these things in this time and age, but this is about caring for each other. This is about ensuring that we uh, look out also for each other's uh, wellbeing. But I invite um, Anne to come forward uh, to help with the distribution. As you come forward, you will be given um, uh, your uh, little pack which uh, includes the wine and the bread. Just take it back to your seat and when everybody has been uh, uh, served, we will share together. Come for all is prepared.
take the, the, uh, the top off to reveal the bread that's underneath. I invite you to take the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. And the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you. Take, drink, and may it keep you in eternal life. We thank you, God our Father, that through word and sacrament, you have given us your Son, who is the true bread of heaven and food of eternal life to strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the prayers of the people. Righteous and merciful God, in trust we offer our prayers for the world, our community and ourselves. Father, all your creation declares your glory and proclaims the work of your hands. Hear our prayers for the preservation of the earth. You have entrusted us its fragile beauty to delight in. We pray that we may be good tenants and stewards of your creation. Bring us to a right understanding that you are the owner and not, not us. That our vocation is to protect and cherish the land, the creatures and wonders of your creation and share justly the abundance that you provide. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear, hear your prayer. We pray for our world, for places that are mired in violence and where people are hungry and do not know where the next meal will come from. Encourage and strengthen those who seek to help our suffering people and the organisations and churches to whom they belong. Teach us, your people, to generously share your abundance. May the spirit and mind of Jesus be in our thinking, feeling, planning and working. So we bring healing to your hurting and torn world. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear, our hear prayer. our prayer. In our own community, we pray for those in need, for the unemployed, for those suffering from addictions, for the sick, lonely, those who are sorrowing, and all those in pain. Touch our hearts so that we can reach out in love and compassion. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for your church throughout the world and for its leaders. Here at Aikenvale, we pray that you will continue to guide us as we begin the process of establishing our leaders for the year ahead. May we all seek to discern your calling 
and our lives. <clears throat> and today we especially pray for those of our number who continue to struggle with health issues. We think especially of Heather and Ian, Fred, and those of whom we are unaware. And for ourselves, merciful God, give us strength and courage to keep your commandments and to live in faithful obedience to your will. Save us from any distractions from living out our commitment to you. Help us to find our true worth in knowing you more fully and serving you more faithfully. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. final um, uh, hymn this morning um, reflects the words that we heard from Isaiah. Shall we sing about a garden? Let us uh, stand um, and uh, sing about the, the garden that we're placed in and the way that we can work to ensure that we cultivate the, uh, the, the fruit uh, within our lives and in the lives of people around us. Let's stand and sing.
in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value about that of knowing Christ. Press onward towards the ultimate prize of being one with Him. And may God's perfect world revive your soul. May Christ Jesus be your Saviour and your Rock, and may the Holy Spirit strengthen you and press you on. Our servants and end, go now in mission and service. And in the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all.